Welcome back to another episode of the Outsider Sports Baseball Podcast. Corey Jason here alongside Ben Mandel and Dylan Mel here today. Guys, we got a good one, but let's start it off hot. A little controversy coming out of the uh, the minor leagues. Fernando Tatis Jr. hits a home run off of a triple-A pitcher in a rehab game. And people were talking about how the opposing pitcher, he's going to tell his grandkids about how he gave up a home run to Fernando Tatis Jr. And the guy says to the pitcher, he says, cheater hits home run on rehab assignment during steroid suspension. Now we should note that Tatis is serving a 80 game suspension for uh, steroids, but he's due back around 420. And since he was also injured, he's allowed to play rehab games in the minors while serving the suspension. The opposing pitcher was, Cade McClure, 27 years old. This is his first year with San Fran. It's a San Fran affiliate in Sacramento. Tatis is playing for the Padres affiliate out in El Paso. So, guys, how how do you feel about the pitchers thinking of cheater hits home run and not really giving Tatis any credit? Is this something that's going to hang over Tatis's head for the rest of his career, or are people really getting that anger out now so we can appreciate his greatness later on down the road. Look at Houston. I think people still hate on Houston, but people have become more accepting of Houston at this point. And, you know, acknowledging, hey, this team is just really good. Maybe they cheated, but they're still really good. And I think that's what it'll come to be with Tatis. In terms of uh, McClure, this pitcher, he needs to just mind his own business. Whether he's a cheater or not, he just came in there and hit an absolute bomb off of you. Just take your L, hang your hat, you know, tip your cap. You got beat. It's baseball. It happens. No need to go out there. There's a reason he went and deleted the tweet because there's just no need for it. You're 27 years old and pitching in AAA. That's just a loser's mentality. Yeah, Ben, I... Couldn't agree more with you. Uh, I think it's funny that Tatis is on the rehab assignment for the El Paso Chihuahuas, yet McFleur is the one that's yapping. Okay, Twitter fingers, let's keep it moving. Tatis is a star in the MLB, and your goal is just to get there. It's not really a good look to start dissing one of potentially your future teammates, depending on how it goes for you. I get it that maybe they're rivals right now, and I'm sure he was a little upset after the game that – People were dogging him when Tatis is this great player, and he's just trying to find his way in the MLB. But Twitter fingers isn't going to help you get called up. I'm conflicted when it comes to this. On one hand, I support letting guys like Bonds, Clemens, and A-Rod and Sosa into the Hall of Fame because no matter what they did extra-wise, their talent was still there and they still had to do it. But on the flip side... I feel like a guy like Tatis is going to get off easy. A lot of these guys had to deal with that stigma for forever. And a lot of the same people that chastise Bonds and Clemens and A-Rod are celebrating Tatis. I think Tatis should be allowed to grow and put this behind him. But what does it say when we let somebody else get away with it in a time where we know it's illegal and failing tests and all that? And you know, hang proverbially guys that did it when it wasn't a crime against the sport and it was almost encouraged by the league. So I think the uh, pitcher McClure was wrong to to tweet that out. I think he could have just held his tongue and it would have blew right over. But the sentiment behind it is what we're going to see from a lot of players. And I'm sure he's not alone with how he feels about Tatis, you know, basically getting a pass and, like Dylan, you or Ben, I believe, brought up the Astros, right? And they're another group of people that cheated and they're getting a pass as players, pretty much. They're gonna this is gonna blow over, just be a blip on their radars of their career. And it just seems like the way the league is now and the way the fans are now, things will be a big story for a hot second and then just blow over and we can move past it. But that's only for players that play now, the ones that we see all the time. And the ones that happened in the past, we kind of still hold on to as issues, even now when they're long, long gone. So it just seems like the mentality and the mindset surrounding this 
just isn't consistent throughout every issue, similar and not. Yeah, I so I actually do want to bring this up because, Dylan, I believe I brought this up on your podcast last summer when the Tati suspension came down. And it was, I think the biggest thing for Tatis is the timing of this suspension and when it came down for him and why he's going to be able to necessarily work past it. He still hasn't accomplished what he would need to accomplish in order to get to the Hall of Fame. Now that he has had that failed PED test, he's going to be under a microscope. You know, they're going to watch him like a hawk to make sure he doesn't do it again. So if he does go and accomplish those things, you know he's done it clean. The guys who, you know, there's not proof that they did it clean. And that's where, you know, Tatis will be able to move forward from it. But the only way he does is if he has success. You know, if he doesn't have any success, then maybe there was something to it. Maybe he really was cheating and maybe he was using this longer than we thought. If he goes out there and plays baseball the way we have seen him play over the last few years and his progression continues towards being that superstar we think he can be, then it, that's why it gets overlooked. Because you you can see it really wasn't something he was using to better his game. Yeah, Ben, again, I think me and you stand uh, the same line on this issue with Tatis. This guy is only 24 years old. If he goes on to have an illustrious career, he's not even in his prime yet and doesn't get popped again. We're going to forget about this, but rightfully so, because the wide majority of his accomplishments will have come after this. And with the steroid era in baseball, set that aside for me with PDs really in any sport, it's a two strikes and you're out mentality. One time I could believe that maybe it was in a medication that you didn't know, or maybe you just made a mistake because you were young, like Fernando Tatis, and you felt the pressure of the world on you. The next emerging superstar on the cover of MLB The Show, you're supposed to lead this Padres franchise now over a Dodgers team that's been consistently great for a long time. I could see the world where it happened. Now, hopefully he comes back, goes back to the level of baseball that he was playing, and we can put this aside. But I agree strongly with your point of it happened so early on in his career, years before his prime even begun, and we can differentiate the accomplishments before and after, and there'll be a lot more after. Yeah, and I'm I'm in the same line of thinking as you guys that we can move past it because it happened so early. I just think it sucks that it happened. I I didn't want to even have any type of doubt about Tatis because he was just so much fun to watch. So you'll always have that doubt in the back of your head. But if he plays the rest of his career without any issues, and he's going to be under a microscope like you guys said, I think people will look past it as a blip on the radar, just like something that happened, but we can forget about it because he's shown that he didn't need it, whether it was a lapse in judgment or really a finicky uh, medication issue that he just didn't know about. If he's got no other, you know, red marks on his record, then this is something we can look past. But if that, you know, shadow of a doubt remains, if there's whispers about him doing other stuff, or even if he has other stuff outside of baseball that kind of changes your opinion on him, then that's where this kind of sticks with him because you kind of you kind of put together a picture of what he might be. But hopefully he stays clean that this was either a, a one-time deal or it was really just a medication issue for a fungal infection stemming from a haircut. I think that uh, I think he'll be able to move past this, but we also need to to understand the other players' frustrations. McClure is a 27-year-old guy who hasn't made it past double uh, – who's just made it to AAA, drafted by the White Sox, first year with the Giants, And he gets taken deep by Tatis, who's serving a suspension and playing in a rehab game. The the frustrations are there because he feels like a guy like Tatis, if he's doing it or if he got caught, who else didn't get caught? And all this, you know, affects his career. Maybe that home run prevents him from getting up to the majors. It affects his stat line and his mentality. And we know a lot of these guys, because of how hard they work and the long hours they put in, I don't want to say they're fragile because that's not what they are, but they they live in an area and they operate in an area where they're always on the edge. 
they're looking for that edge and that kind of puts their their head in that mentality of I'm the best, I can beat the best. So when you know that a guy is getting an, an illegal edge on you or has that aura about him, that kind of messes with you mentally a little bit, or at least it did for this guy. But hopefully they both move past this and we see McClure face Tatis at Oracle Park one day and maybe McClure will strike him out and we can all laugh about it. Now in other news, sticking with the minor leagues, the Rocket City Trash Pandas, the Angels double-A team, no hit the Chattanooga Lookouts, Cincinnati's double-A team. The little issue here, though, is the Trash Pandas lost 7-5. Starter Coleman Crow, he threw six no-hit innings. The game only won seven innings because this was game two of a doubleheader. In the minor leagues, they're still doing the seven-inning no uh, doubleheaders. So Coleman Crow threw six no-hit shutout innings before 2022 third-round pick Ben Joyce. You might remember him from being that hard thrower from the SEC last year. Throws harder than anybody in the minor leagues before he came in and ruined the whole thing. So let me give you a, a rundown of how this seventh inning went. Walk, walk, pop out for out number one. Walk, strikeout swinging out number two. Walk, scores three to one. E8, where the center fielder misplayed the ball and it bounced off his glove. Three run uh, three run score, so the score is now 4-3. Chattanooga winning. Joyce is then removed for a pitcher, Eric Torres. And he came in and kept that party rolling. Hit by pitch, hit by pitch, hit by pitch. 5-3 the score. Walk, 6-3. to three. Wild pitch, 7-3 to three the score. Hit by pitch. To add insult to injury. Strikeout to end the inning. And the score is going to settle around 7-5, where the Trash Pandas were able to get two more runs in the bottom of the seventh. But, guys, that was game one of a doubleheader. Only seven innings long. I mean, this is impressive. It really is impressive. Sticking with the double headers, though, in Division Two baseball, Brody Ware of the University of Indianapolis in Game Two of their double header went seven innings, eleven strikeouts, no runs, no hits, and he went four for four with four five RBIs, a single, a double, a triple, and a home run in a fourteen nothing win over jury, the Jury Panthers. So he threw a no hitter, a complete game no hitter shutout. We have to emphasize the shutout because of what we just talked about before with the trash pandas and the lookouts. So he threw a no hitter and hit for a cycle in the same game. Otani's now got something to strive for. If you ask me also to talk about Liam Hendricks closer from the white Sox, He was diagnosed with non Hodgkin lymphoma back in January. He just rang the bell. He finished his final round of chemo and he's looking good. He's able to return to active play on May 29th. Yeah, Corey, I think this is one of those real feel-good moments in sports where it kind of reminds you that these athletes are humans as well. You know, as uh, crappy as it is to say, many people listening, um, including myself, and, you know, we've dealt with a friend or family member that's gone through a serious health issue, whether it be cancer or not. And to see him battle through this and get back to living his dream is just one of those bright moments in sports that I hope doesn't go unrecognized and underappreciated. Yeah, Hendricks is a guy that seems to be widely respected and loved around the sport between its players and its fans. He's always outspoken. The Australian accent really uh, makes him a fan favorite, the foul mouth that he has. But uh, this is something great to see, finishing chemo, and hopefully once he's mentally and physically ready to get back out there because what he went through – was obviously had to have been mentally taxing and draining on him and his family. So once he's able to put all that behind him and get back on the field, uh, I'm sure the ovation and just the whole fanfare around his return will be a sight to behold, really. Other uh, milestone news, though, Nolan Arenado hit his 300th career home run. So he's starting to hit those milestone numbers that you really look for, those benchmarks in a Hall of Fame career. Ronnie Gajanik. She's the first female full-time high-A manager to manage a game. She's there with Arizona's high-A affiliate. So that's another one where women in sports are just slowly climbing up. I'm sure within the next 
two decades, we're going to see our first female major league manager. The Yankees have Rachel Belkovic doing their low A affiliate managing them. I actually went down and saw her manage a game last spring when Jason Dominguez played with them on the Tampa Tarpons. And the whole crowd, at least I can speak from my experience, when she went out there, you know, to hand out the lineup cards and basically anytime she did anything, the crowd was cheering for her and chanting her name just along with the players. So it seemed like everybody was really excited to see what the future holds for uh, for her and really any other woman that's moving up in the sports ladder. We also have the Rays, who've now won nine straight games by four runs or more. They're starting off the season 9-0. and oh. They've won every game by at least four runs. This is the first time since 1884. Now, to put that in perspective, what was going on in 1884, the mound was 50 feet from home plate, and 1884 was the first year pitchers were allowed to throw the ball overhand. Thank you, Jeff Passett, who thanks ESPN Stats and Info for that little tidbit. But that's just insane. They've won nine games by four more runs with a differential of more than 50. First time since 1884. You, you have names like the New York Gothams on that list. Not any recognizable teams. That's just insane. Yeah, this is unbelievable. And I understand the competition may not be there for the Tampa Bay Rays, but it's the run differential. You can't control who you play, but you can control how you beat them. And they have just been winning games decisively. Not a single one-run game, and quite frankly, not a single game that has been a save situation. They haven't needed the high-leverage bullpen guys. These guys have just been hitting the cover off the ball, and they've been doing a fantastic job Love to see Wander Franco continue his development into a superstar at shortstop. It'll only be a few more years until he gets traded out of Tampa. So, you know, for the Rays, they they have very quickly retooled. And, you know, we talked about if they want to be a playoff team, Wander Franco is going to have to step up and be that power guy in the lineup, the guy who drives them, and he's been doing it so far. Yeah, Ben, the Tampa Bay Rays right now are just the definition of getting the job done. Did the schedule gods bless them with the Tigers, Nationals, and Athletics to start the year? Absolutely. But those are the teams that if you're going to be a playoff team, you need to be able to beat up on. And I'd say they're doing a pretty good job at beating up on them. The best run differential in baseball. The pitching and hitting are both there for Tampa right now. And we talked about this in our preseason show. We mentioned Tampa as one of those on-the-verge AL wildcard teams, and we said it. It looks like their roster is getting worse and worse the past couple years, and this might be the year that they miss. And we're not the only ones that said that. Tampa is a team that's playing motivated and wants to show why they are a team that continuously makes the playoffs and that they will still continuously make the playoffs. Tampa is a team that just refuses to go away. No matter how many players they lose, how many homegrown fan favorites they trade away, they're always in the thick of the dogfight. And them doing what they're doing, and again, against lesser opponents, but that's what you need to do against lesser opponents, they're doing things the right way. Luckily, every team plays every team this year with the new MLB schedule format. So all of our teams will be able to play the A's, Tigers, and Nationals. So... It's not like the Rays are getting games against teams that we won't be seeing. So it's just lucky for them that they got to start the season off with all three of those teams in a row. But no matter whether you play them in April or August, you have to win those games, and that's what the Rays are doing. And the Rays aren't fully healthy yet. They're still waiting to get, like, Tyler Glass now back. Imagine what he can do for that rotation. I mean, Wander Franco is starting to come into his own. He... Everybody knew he was a superstar, and he's slowly becoming what everybody expected, especially this first week. He's just been phenomenal. Brandon Lau and just everybody, Yandy Diaz, Randy Arozarena, all these guys are just consistently playing well, and I just don't, anticip I just don't expect it to stop anytime soon. Yeah, Corey, you know, when I – was speaking about the Rays previously, I didn't mention any players because you don't want to leave anybody out. 
the whole team is playing great. The pitching from top to bottom is fantastic. The hitting from top to bottom is fantastic. Of course, Franco and Rosarina are the stars of this team. But then you have Josh Lowe is batting 364 right now out of nowhere. You go and look at the pitching and you think, yeah, everybody knows McClanahan. But Jeffrey Springs, 19 strikeouts through two games, a zero ERA. I mean, he's just been perfect so far to start, obviously, as has the whole team. But this team is going to be around all season. I don't want to be in prisoner of the moment, an overreactor, but coming into the year, I was 50-50 on whether or not this team would be a wild card team. And to me, they look like they're going to be around to stay. And they may even push back on the AL East division with the Yankees and the Blue Jays and make it a three-team race. I'm fully expecting them to be in the thick of it. Again, it's early. It's still early April. So there's still a long season to go, and we still do need to see the Rays play a team that is playoff caliber. But with that said, any good playoff caliber team needs to be able to beat up on the lower tier guys, and that is what Tampa's doing, and they're doing it in such a dominant fashion. Yeah, really the pitching, right? They can certainly push for the American League East if Jeffrey Springs is really that guy, right? People are talking about it. I'm not necessarily sold on him yet because of the lineups he's facing, but the stuff looks good. He's living up to the hype from spring training. He looks really, really strong so far. And it, when they get Glass now back, you pair the th – that's a three-headed monster at the top of the rotation if Springs continues to live up to the hype. Yeah, so it's wait and see what Tampa – We'll see how they fare in their uh, in week three of the season. But we got some other news to go over. The minor league players have agreed to join the Major League Baseball's Players Association, the union. What this means, since it was ratified by all the minor league players, plus ownership and the commissioner's office, this means that players in the minor leagues are covered under a union uh, threshold. They're able to... Now, double their pay. That was one of the things negotiated. Teams will cover living expenses for them, housing and all that. But also, players now won't necessarily need to work other jobs and odd jobs in the offseason. We remember that story about Randy Dobnak with the Twins, how he had to be an Uber driver in the offseason to make ends meet before make, uh, making it with the big league club. Guys don't necessarily need to do that now because they're going to get a steady paycheck for 11 months out of the year. I believe it's from January through November, players will get pay, paid their salary, and that includes going into spring training. Beforehand, players never got paid in spring training, and they only got paid in season, so April through September. So October all the way through March, players were working off their savings and other money made. They weren't getting fresh money and put into their, uh, their accounts in their life. So they had to learn how to budget and save throughout the season, and what they were getting paid was meager at most. So now doubling their salaries and letting that be spread out through the year, it's going to be a game changer, among other things. And the players are now covered with health care and all that. And this is good not just for the guys that get shuttled between the majors and the minors, but the career minor leaguers and the guys that make it only like two, three years. These are everybody's going to benefit from this. Guys, you have any thoughts on the uh, the minor league in the major league uh, union coming together and really helping out these players? Yeah, just a few things. Um, I didn't get to spend a ton of time around the rail riders during my time out there in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, but I did cover them a bit, and I did get to talk to a few players. And some of the guys who went up and down, Clint Frazier, for example, was one of the guys around every now and then when I was there, and. I mean, it was just frustrating for him because he had to have places at the major league level as well as in Wilkes-Barre Scranton because he was just going up and down all the time. This was before they even capped the amount of times a player can go up and down at six from the major leagues to the minor leagues. It was happening more than that for some players. So it's just not an ideal situation that they were in. So hats off to the Players Association for taking care of the young guys and the minor leaguers because, you know, while you may say guys like Max Scherzer, they're trying to get their paydays and everything, 
the end of the day, they're also fighting for these young guys. So the future is better for them. At the end of the day, guys like Scherzer, they've made their money. They're fighting for the future. And that's where you got to tip your cap to them. Yeah, Ben, I couldn't help but agree, especially with that last point you made there. You know, I don't have the inside intel that you have there, but MLB is a league that makes a lot of money. And those major league players, there's no salary cap. There's a lot of money to go around. And it just kind of sucks that it took this long for minor league players that really build the foundation of these teams' futures. And guys that are chasing their dreams to have to sacrifice so much and not know what's going to happen to you any given day, how much you're going to have to move. It's long overdue that the MLB step in, the Players Association step in, and really start making it just a little bit easier for these guys to chase those dreams. Yeah, I'm interested to see where this goes and what other things are negotiated when this negotiation, uh, when this contract is up. How does the next CBA negotiation affect the miners? Do they have separate meetings and negotiations for them? And who represents the miners because there's so much turnover? Whereas in the majors, you have guys like Scherzer, who, who's been in the majors for you know 15 years, it seems, compared to the miners, where guys only go there for a few years before graduating to the majors union. So what players and how do they bring these guys to the table with all the turnover that there is? Now, let's get into some other stuff, Some a new segment that we did last week, Studs and Duds. We did have some games this week, and players performed well, and other players not so much. So we're going to start it off with Ben. Ben, who was your stud and who was your dud for this past week? So my stud, I'm going with the polar bear, Pete Alonzo. He had a great week. And he just seemed to hit the ball out of the yard. Now, the Mets themselves may not have had their best week, but in terms of what Alonzo did this past seven days, five for 23, but four home runs in that stretch as well as eight RBIs. He has five home runs now on the season with 10 RBIs to go with it. Five walks on the season as well. He's getting on base. The power's there. The polar bear very well could be heading towards another 50 home run season. Now, my dud, it's Jose Barrios. And I'm just going to put him here because he's, I vouched for you, dude. Come on. I was sticking my neck out for you to start this season. And he is just, I, I mean, I hate to say he's been babbit to death, but he really has. The stuff's there. He's striking guys out. He's throwing innings. Two starts, nine and two-third innings, but he's given up 12 earned runs. He's only walked three, and he struck out 12. The strikeouts are there. The walks are are low, but, you know, he's getting babbit to death. The average exit velocity for him is 88 miles an hour. Nothing too crazy. They're just finding holes. And for Jose Barrios, you, hopefully this, this stuff is good enough to eventually produce the results, but... It doesn't look like it after his first two starts, and it doesn't get any easier because I'm pretty sure his next start is against the Rays. Yeah, with well, Barrios, I remember when we were doing our team previews, and I said that the uh, the Mets dodged a bullet not getting Barrios. Kind of warms my heart to see that at least to start the year that I was right. I was not a big Barrios fan then. I'm not a big Barrios fan now. So, you know, good on the Mets for uh, for whiffing on him because they are so much better off without him. Now, my stud is uh, Adam Duvall from the Boston Red Sox. This past week, he had six hits, six RBIs, three walks, only one strikeout, one home run, and he's hitting 483 on the year. Had a little injury scare today. We're going to see how that turns out with him. But he's somebody who's starting off the year real hot for a team that's not doing so well. So he's somebody we could see around the trade deadline whose name is going to be thrown around to go to a team. My dud, though, one of my fantasy sleepers, not really doing it for me right now. Edward Cabrera from the Miami Marlins, starting pitcher. First in New York Mets this week, he went two and two thirds of an inning, seven walks, two earned runs. He got the L, gave up no hits, and had four Ks. But seven walks in two and two thirds of an inning is horrendous. That's something that you know just should never happen, especially from somebody who's touted as having great accuracy. So. I'm just really worried about how that's going to shake out, but he's my dud this week. Dylan, who is your stud and who is your dud? Yeah, so for the audience, this is my first stud and dud, so give me some uh, breathing room here. 
But uh, let me see if I can keep up with these guys. Excellent analysis. I have, as my stud, a little bit of a homer pick, but I have Glaber Torres. And coming into Sunday's contest, he has the highest on-base percentage in the MLB, just over 500. glaber has been getting on base at a great clip. He's batting over 350 this season. He uh, has six RBIs. Him and Aaron Judge are having very similar starts to their year. And if you're in a conversation with having similar starts to the year with the reigning MVP, you know you're doing great. And the reason that I wanted to highlight Glaber is because this is a guy that we've seen be an all-star before. We know he has the potential to keep up this level of consistency. Now, I'm not saying he's going to bat 375 and have an on-base percentage of 500 all year, but we know he can play at an all-star level similar to Aaron Judge. And Glaber Torres, he's my stud this week, but I'm not sure if it'll be the last time. And for my dud, you know I had to take a shot at the Houston Astros. Alex Bregman taking Ben's dud from last week. This guy's still batting 150, only has one RBI on the season, and has yet to record an extra base hit. That guy is my dud. Now let's get into our top 10 rankings. The outsider sports conglomerate, everybody averaged in together. This is how we have everybody ranked. Going from 1st to 10th, we have the Braves, Rays, Dodgers. That's 1 through 3. Yankees at 4, Brewers 5, Twins 6, Astros 7, Mets 8, Cleveland at 9, Padres at 10. Other teams receiving votes, Toronto, Texas, and the Angels. Guys, is there anybody who stood out to you that you, in your personal rankings that you that you think should get a mention? Is there anybody that really kind of stood out to you these first two weeks of the season? I want to first go on record and say, because my power rankings are vastly different from our pre-opening day rankings. And that's because, you know, you, I don't want to punish teams for having good starts just because, yeah, I don't think they're going to be good. And it's only been a week and a half. At the same time, I don't want to overreact. So I went and strictly based my power rankings off of run differential. Now, obviously, I didn't go in order of the best and worst run differentials, but it played a heavy role in terms of who I put in each spot. And the team I want to talk about, it's the Milwaukee Brewers. Now, they're a team that very easily would have been higher and if I had went strictly off of the run differential but they're a team that hasn't necessarily played the best competition. I know the New York Mets are a good team, and they swept them, and they beat the living hell out of them. And that's why I want to talk about them, because this is a team that if they get the offense and they can hit, they're very dangerous because the pitching is there. Peralta, another great outing from him behind Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff. You know, this is a rotation that certainly – is one of, if not the best in baseball. And if they continue to get good pitching and the hitting to go right along with it, this is going to be a very difficult division for the Cardinals to win. And all of a sudden, the Brewers are right back in the conversation. Yeah, Ben, I think that's a good shout at the Brewers. I know me and you were pretty high on the Cardinals coming into the season, so it'll be interesting to see if the Brew crew can keep this uh, hot streak going and maybe make that division more competitive than we thought. Uh, the team I want to talk about is the Toronto Blue Jays. I had them in my power rankings, and I know that their record is not the best. However, in their last six games, they are 5-1. and one. They do have the sixth most runs scored in the MLB. They got off to a slow start, but this is a team in a lineup that is dangerous. I don't want to forget everything that we knew going into the season with a lot of these teams, like the Blue Jays. Astros and some teams that got off to some slower starts. We know that baseball is a long haul of a season and there are some great teams that will start off a little bit slow, but I love what I'm seeing from the Blue Jays, especially from their two young studs, Bo Bichette and Vlad Guerrero. Both guys, when you average out, their batting average comes to about 400. You got five homers and 14 RBIs between the two of them and Matt Chapman has been on another level for Toronto. Keep your eye out on them to climb up the power rankings and make the consensus this upcoming week. The team I want to key in on here is the fool's gold of baseball, the Los Angeles Angels. They're a team that every year going into the season, 
people are like, this is the year Mike Trout gets back to the playoffs. This is the year they finally do something with their otherworldly talent. And every year they fall short. But I'm starting to buy in on this fool's goal just a little bit. Right now they technically lead the AL West at 5-4. and four, But that plus 18 run differential leads their division. And there's just something about them. You have Trout who just is having a insane start to the year. I mean, just listen to this. He's hitting 346 in eight games. That's a 528 on base percentage, 769 slugging, eight runs, eight RBIs, three home runs, nine walks, only five strikeouts. He's he's starting off right where he left off before the injuries. He's somebody that, you know, if Otani wasn't in the league, we'd be calling Mike Trout the, the perennial uh, MVP now, just how it was before Otani came in. And then you drop that. Otani's got eight games. He's hitting 321. 424 on base, 607 slugging, with six RBIs, two home runs, five walks. He has struck out 10 times, but he's doing that all while pitching. And he's pitching in his two starts to an 075 ERA in 12 innings. He's just, he's on an insane tear. And while the hitting may not be on the same level that we're used to through just a few games, this is the best he's looked pitching ever. The Angels are a team that could be scared. Gary, and if they're good, maybe Otani looks to stay and finish what he started with Trout. We're overlooking the Angels because they didn't have any pitching, but they're winning games. They're over 500. They're a team that's really, really fun to watch right now. And with that one two Hall of Fame punch in Trout and Otani, because they deserve all the love on this team, it's just a sight to behold. Yeah, Corey, just a quick comment on you said that we're overlooking the Angels and it's possible that we are, but I've been a guy who has fallen for the Angels trap year after year now and I'm just done for it. Maybe I'll look bad and I'll be like, oh, I overlooked them, but I got to see them playing great baseball contending for this division post All-Star break for me to really start to acknowledge this team. Yeah, I don't love the Angels pitching, even with Otani, but I do have to say, my biggest thing with Otani was up until the last couple of years, like his first year, yeah, you know, he was, like everyone talked about how amazing it was that he was both hitting and pitching, but I didn't really see that, oh yeah, you know, he could get some swings and misses and some strikeouts, but that above average stuff, like it felt like he was just an average pitcher. And he has really stepped that up the last couple of years. He's been consistently able to stay on the mound and healthy in pitch. And, you know, this year the ERA looks great through his first couple starts. And he he does look like he might be able to go for a Cy Young as well as an MVP. Uh, maybe even, you know, winning both of those awards. That would be something special, wouldn't it? <laughs> MVP, Cy Young, and a batting title. Who knows? I don't see a batting title for him, but still, this is a guy who is very, very much still getting better, and that's what's scary for the league. And, you know, when you have that and Mike Trout with the start he's on, what can't this team do? Yeah, the pitching's rough, but there are a lot of other teams that have some bad pitching staffs as well that have made it into our top 10. Now, I I do have a question for you, Ben, as our resident Met fan. You didn't have them in your top 10 rankings this year. And I know you said you went off run differential, but how do you keep the Mets out of a top 10 ranking, especially when it's not like they're playing poorly? The Mets are the Mets are a good team, right? Their record is over 500 or is 500. They're five and five, but they've just had a gauntlet of a schedule against a pesky Marlins team and a really surprising brew crew. How do you how do you not sneak them in at nine or ten just for your own sanity? Well, and look, and that's strictly because I thought there were ten other teams more deserving this week. 
It's not that I think the Mets are a bad team. It's not that I think the sky is falling. I'm not Frank the Tank who thinks they're going to go get swept by the Padres this uh, upcoming week. I think that for the Mets, this is a team that, yeah, they're good, but they haven't shown to me that they're a top 10 team in the league. Yeah, they took three out of four in Miami. They just took two out of three at home against Miami. But you got swept by the Brewers, who are legitimate competition, and they were helpless in two out of those three games. That says something to me. That shows me that, yeah, this is a good team. Verlander's not back yet. Once they get more guys back, who knows, I might have them back in. They still made it into the top 10, which shows the perception. I just looked at this strictly off of 10 days of baseball and what I thought through those first 10 days and what the top 10 deserving teams were. And again, I think the way you win games is significant. The Mets, the way you lose games is significant as well, and it shows how much fight you actually have. And, you know, the Mets have lost some games in some pretty big fashion that you weren't necessarily seeing at the beginning of the year last year. Yeah, a point that I want to bring up is motivation and uh, your will to win matters so much throughout stretches in baseball. And, you know, one thing that I personally took notice of the teams that are performing a lot better out the gate are the ones that feel that they have something to prove, right? Tampa, Minnesota, the Rangers, the Angels, the Brewers. These are all teams that we talked about as potential wildcard teams. Where are they on this borderline? And all of them want to come out and prove that they have it. Meanwhile, the Dodgers, Padres, Mets, Yankees to an extent, Astros, teams that we all talked about as definitive playoff teams, without a doubt, are all hovering around a little bit above or a little bit under 500, coming out the gate slow, just a little bit less motivation probably in those clubhouses, dealing with some injury, waiting to get the full teams back, while those other teams really came out storming, trying to prove a point. Yeah, I'm not worried about the Mets. I think the Mets are going to be fine. They'll be back competing for the title. I, I just think that the Mets are going through a weird period right now where they don't really – they don't have an identity, I want to say. Going in, everybody thought it was going to be pitching, 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 and then injuries happened. It kind of took that away. But you have guys like Pete Alonso stepping up and who's having an – at least having a start to what could be an MVP season. But the Mets, the Mets are going to be fine. I think once they start getting their players back, And once they kind of get back into that mindset, and maybe if they bring up one of those guys like Vientos and Mauricio and pair him with Alvarez, who's now up, and somebody who should have been up for the whole season, the Mets will really get a groove going. Yeah, and, you know, Navarez is there, and I like Navarez. I understand why they sent Alvarez down. Navarez is going to be out for a while. Alvarez has the chance now, uh, uninterrupted. This is going to be his job to lose. I know Nito's going to get some time, but Alvarez is going to have a chance, and who knows, maybe the Mets get rid of either Navarez or Nito, or they carry three catchers. Who knows? This is a lot of uh, a lot of moves they can have and a lot of good problems that they can have. You can never have too many catchers, and when you look at the pitching, I actually think Carlos Carrasco might be the guy who gets the boot. This is a the guy they were shopping Uh, This offseason, they wanted to get rid of him because they want guys like Peterson and McGill in the rotation. I think Peterson and McGill have been solid so far to start the season off. And when you look at how the Mets have played behind them, it's been strong. Carrasco has been the biggest doozy. I know Scherzer is going to be Scherzer. He's fine. I'm not worried. Maybe you need to start yanking him a little bit earlier on, early in the season. I know he may say he's full go. Maybe wait until May to let him start throwing seven innings. I don't know. It seems like in the sixth inning every time is when he's running into trouble now in his first two starts. I, I, that's just a casual fan. I don't know. I'm not Buck Walter. I'm not the manager. But certainly a lot of different moves that they can make And in terms of when Verlander comes back. I still think the pitching's good. Really love what I've seen out of Kodai Senga so far. He's been fantastic, much more than I could have asked for. I think the ghost fork ball looks great. His off-speed stuff is missing barrels. I know his two starts have been against the Marlins, but like you said, Corey, this is a pesky Marlins team who can still hit the ball. Yeah, Ben, I wanted to highlight Sanga as well. And, you know, is it because I was smart enough to take him in our fantasy baseball league? Yes. 
But he's really come out the gate strong for this Mets team. And without Verlander, we know Scherzer's going to start a little bit slower. Sanga has come out on fire. one five nine ERA through two starts, 14 strikeouts. This guy is legit. And really what I like, what I'm seeing is it, there's always a question when Japanese pitchers come over, how's their stuff going to look at the MLB level? Well, his stuff looks like he can really be a great third pitcher for this team in playoff series. When you're the Mets, you're thinking playoff series, playoff wins. Kota Senga could get you there. Now, another team I kind of want to also highlight is the Yankees because they're dealing with a lot of injuries. Rodon, Severino, Bader. You have Loisaga who just went down, Donaldson. And they're just, they need to tread water. At least that's kind of how I feel that they need to do. Just tread water, stay above 500 and competitive until these guys get back. And then you're cooking with gas. What do you guys think? Yeah, Corey. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. The Yankees, we knew that they like to play it safe with these injuries because, again, as I mentioned earlier, they're one of these teams that's thinking about October baseball, not so much April. That's why Rodon starting the season on the IL, potentially Severino as well, Bader. And, you know, that's why you want to take it easy with a guy like Donaldson. They're doing plenty good enough right now, sitting at six and three, that they can take their time. Funny enough, the Yankees always start off slow. Six and three is their best start to a season since 2010. It ties their best start. The Yankees are actually performing above expectations for the start of the season. Now, did they get lucky potentially with Baltimore and San Francisco? We'll see how it shakes out for those teams as well as Philadelphia, who got up to a really slow start. They got a big stretch of games coming up this week that I know we'll talk about with some AL Central opponents. But I'm happy as a Yankees fan with where they're at right now. I mentioned earlier, Glaber and Judge are performing excellent as expected for Judge and a very nice welcoming surprise from Gleyber Torres. Yeah, I think the big thing to look at with the Yankees, and this is where, in terms of the power rankings, they it's week one. It really doesn't matter. So when you look at the power rankings, or, or when you look at a team and judging how your season's going to go, like the Yankees, you look at positives and negatives. What are some of the positives right now? And there's a lot more positives than negatives. Positives, like you said, Glaber Torres performing the way he is. If you can get Glaber Torres to be the player he is supposed to be, that is a game changer for this lineup. When you look at the Yankees, everything has been to cover up for Glaber Torres just not being the player they expected. Now, all of a sudden, if Glaber Torres pops and is able to hit, it's okay if Anthony Volpe takes his time to start getting the back going and, you know, getting the average up. As long as Volpe's playing good defense, finding a way to get on base in key situations and stealing bags, he's going to be a okay. especially if Glaber Torres, another guy in the middle infield perhaps, is able to get things going and really swing the back well as well you know you have Aaron Judge you have Giancarlo Stanton uh, another big power bat in the lineup you don't necessarily need the home runs but when you have Glaber Torres joining those groups of players that's a big positive to look at you know we've talked about it before it's the bats in the playoffs uh, that have been the issue and I talked about having another guy like Rodon and the pitching staff I know he's not there now is able to give the bats confidence and again and if Glaber Torres is able to have a strong season and go into the postseason confidently, it makes a big difference for this lineup. Yeah, somebody else I kind of want to highlight almost is Anthony Volpe. He struggled mightily to start the year, and I think fans are you know starting to get a little antsy when it comes to him. I, for one, believe that he skipped Triple A for the most part. He only played a handful of games. He's still developing. And he's developing early on now. So when we get to the meat of the season, the summer, the dog days, he'll have seen a tremendous amount of MLB pitching, and he really should have been able to catch up by then. We've seen guys like Adley Rutschman and Julio Rodriguez start off slow just like Volpe, and they kind of figured it out without needing to be sent down. So I think sending Volpe down would be detrimental to his development. But he's somebody that, even if he's a black hole in the lineup, 
which I don't even think he is right now. I would rather him there than bring up uh, or put IKF there. Peraza, who's dealing with uh, hamstrings, I believe, right now, issues. I would like him up just to spell Volpe, who's played every game. But that's something that's an issue with roster construction. Then you got guys like Franchi Cordero, who are kind of just coming out of nowhere and being a big uh, part of the reason why the team is performing how they are. He's tied with Judge for the team lead in RBIs, and he's going to be a reason why we end up DFAing Hicks once Bader comes back and we need spots in the outfield. And those are good problems to have when you need to get rid of guys that you're not so sure how to get rid of. We saw this last year. Franchi's almost in that Matt Carpenter type of role where somebody who you expected to just get rid of once the guys that came back healthy came back. And then they play themselves into a spot where you're like, I don't really want to get rid of them. I kind of need them on the roster. So the Yankees have a lot of good stuff going for them. And uh, they just need to get healthy. They just need to figure out what's with the injury bug. They need to bubble wrap Judge and Stanton because Judge is starting off like he could be the MVP again. Stanton's playing well. They, uh, they, they just need to get healthy, and then we can really see what a fully operational Death Star is because they just have so many pieces. Yeah, Corey, I agree. And I think that the Yankees front office knows that health is the, the utmost concern right now. I mentioned earlier, that's why they're taking their time with some of these injuries. Rodon said if it was October, he'd be playing. But instead, they're going to give him a couple weeks. I do want to speak on Anthony Volpe because, you know, how it is with generally just New York teams in general. The fans get a little antsy when people aren't performing. And I do understand some of the concerns from Yankee fans in terms of this guy was built up to some to be the next Derek Jeter, and you want to see it immediately. But Anthony Volpe at every level struggled out the bat, especially when it came to hitting the ball. We knew that this struggle was coming. We've talked about it on the show. But defensively, he has looked solid. But one thing that he really brings to this team is speed. He has an ability to steal bases like the Yankees haven't seen in a while. And they're a team that prides themselves on power. That's how you get the nickname the Bronx Bombers. But to have a guy like Volpe and Bader when he comes back as base-stealing threats, especially with these new rules, is going to make the Yankees just another level of dangerous if their bats can get consistent enough to get them on base. Yeah, and with the Yankees, though, they have a big test coming up this week, along with teams like the Mets. They're going to start to face different competition. Between the Yankees, Mets, and really any other team in the league, is there a series coming up this week, whether it's the April 10th through April 13th games or the April 13th through April 16th games that you guys really kind of want to highlight? Is there a game in particular this week that people should know about and what's going on and how that will affect the teams in it? I want to look at the Rays and Blue Jays next weekend coming up. It's going to be some better competition for the Rays, and I think the Blue Jays are going to be motivated. This is a team that, you know, while uh, they may be – you know, have division aspirations. They're still going to be going for the World Series and beating a team like Tampa early on sets a tone. I think they're going to be motivated to win. I know Jose Barrios is going to be on the mound. Who knows? Maybe we'll see if his stuff is able to actually pan out and result in a win for the Blue Jays. But I do think that for this Toronto team, it's definitely a big motivation for them. And I know, I think Tampa Bay knows that they're going to have to step up and beat some bigger teams as well coming up. They're not going to have a cupcake schedule and a bunch of teams that don't have pitching. Toronto, they have a, so they have some better pitchers that they're going to throw out there. Yeah, Ben, that was one of the series I was most excited for, but I'm actually going to talk about your team, the Mets, as they host the Padres this upcoming week. I think this will be a real exciting matchup, two potential World Series teams going at it early in the season, and before tonight, there's full transparency with the audience. We're recording this during Sunday Night Baseball, and the Padres right now are putting a beating on the Atlanta Braves, but before tonight's game, the Padres' bats were off to a real slow start in terms of getting runs on the board this year. I'm interested to see, is this run, you know, flow tonight going to continue into a series versus the Mets? You have Scherzer on the mound tomorrow. We know what Max Scherzer does, but that'll be a test for the Mets pitchers and Peterson and McGill 
going forward. I'm excited to watch it. A lot of great stars in that series, too. You got Machado, Soto, Bogarts, Alonzo, Lindor. Who doesn't love a series with that many star players? Now, for me, I'm going to stick with one of our favorite teams. I'm going to go the Yankees at Minnesota. The Yankees are going to go on a bit of a NL AL Central kick. They start with Cleveland, then they go to Minnesota, and Minnesota is a team that just really has gotten beat up by the Yankees. 38 and 98 is Minnesota's record versus the Yankees since 2002. The Yankees have almost won 100 games against them since 2002. The Yankees have just displayed incredible just beatdown. I believe the Yankees over their last 162 versus Minnesota dating back even further – They've won like 104 games or something, 102 games against Minnesota. And that includes playoffs and Minnesota having some really good teams. I'm scared every year when the Yankees play the Twins that this will be the year that that streak breaks. It hasn't happened yet. I don't want to think that I'm jinxing it, but it's just something where the Twins have so much to prove this year. Plus, you got that Carlos Correa aspect of him hating the Yankees and his just you know, quote-unquote scumbag mentality, along with the fact that former twin Aaron Hicks has been a leech on the team. And there's a lot of storylines there. The Yankees having uh, Rortvet, who kind of disappeared when they made that trade with the Twins last year, Gary Sanchez, George Urshela for Josh Donaldson and Rortvet. And it just, it just seems like things are, the shoe's waiting to drop. That's really what I'm getting at is, and it, it, the the series concerns me. Hopefully we start to get clarity about the Yankees injured players coming back, but they won't be back for this series. So we could theoretically have a guy like Nestor Cortez and, uh, you know, Garrett Cole go in this series against these guys. But the Yankees need to figure out how to get the bats consistently going and to have the bullpen not blow any games because the bullpen is so injured. We've seen Clay Holmes and Michael King kind of pick it back up and get back to the the dominance that they've once shown. But there's so many guys that, like, you've never heard of. Cordero and Hamilton. Abreu's not that great. A lot of guys that you're just like, where do they come from? Like, I don't know. Hamilton throws a pitch called a Slambio. Where do the Yankees find these guys? So I'm, I'm interested to see what happens when they play a team that really should be a playoff team because all they played is a mediocre Giants team, a cold underperforming Phillies team, and a Baltimore team that's really a year away from getting to be where they want. So this is gonna be the first test. First Cleveland, then Minnesota. We find out what the Yankees are made of early on, at least when they're not at their fully healthiest. But that's gonna do it here for us. Guys, thanks again for listening to the Outsider Sports Baseball Podcast. Search us up, outsidersports.net. Look up Outsider Sports and Outsider Sports 3 on the socials to really follow us and see what we're doing. Keep it tuned in, and we'll see you next time.